Amen. Take your Bibles, would you open them to 1 Samuel chapter 8. It's where we left off last time. We saw the, the value and the joy and the importance of laying out these Ebenezer stones. Remember, they came to that place after victory and Ebenezer stone was laid before that phrase, thus far the Lord has helped me. They had put away their false gods. They confessed their sins. They prayed for God's help, the children of Israel, that is. They commemorated the victory. And if you look back at chapter 7, verse 13, so the Philistines were subdued. You love that. Their enemy was subdued. They did not come anymore into the territory of Israel. And the hand of the Lord was against the Philistines all the days of Samuel. They were subdued. They didn't come back. The hand of the Lord was against them. And what was taken was restored. It says in verse 14, the cities which the Philistines had taken from Israel were restored to Israel. I know some of you are waiting for that promise in your life. That which was taken from you, that which was lost, that which was given up, that which was, was disintegrated because of sin. You're waiting for that yet to be restored. And we see in the children of Israel, uh, even though they didn't deserve it, God restored to them what was taken. From Ekron to Gath, it says, these cities. And Israel recovered its territory from the hands of the Philistines. And there was peace between Israel and the Amorites. And Samuel judged Israel all the days of his life. And he went from year to year on a circuit to Bethel, Gilgal, and Mizpah, and judged Israel in those places. But he always returned to Ramah, for his home was there. And there he judged Israel, and there he built an altar to the Lord. And there, there, there appears to be ample proof of God's faithfulness in the life of Israel. That God was faithful. And there were episodes in the children of Israel's life where they were unfaithful, but God remains faithful. He's just and he's righteous. And here we see his presence, his power in the lives of the children of Israel. And yet, and yet with all that God has done for them, it's still not enough. I wonder how many times we've been there where God has done great and wonderful things. His faithfulness is undisputed, crystal clear, and yet it's not enough. It's a very dangerous place to be. We may call that place of discontentment. It may come, as we'll see in a moment, in times of discouragement or disillusionment. But here we have such a great testimony of Samuel and his ministry. Such a great testimony of God using him and showing his faithfulness. God responding to repentance. God responding to a people that would humble themselves before him. And yet it's still not enough. Because the children of Israel, eyes, they wander around. And with that in mind, pick up in verse 1 of chapter 8 where it came to pass when Samuel was old... And just for you note takers or those of you that like to write in your Bibles, there's about a 20 to 25 year gap between chapter 7 and chapter 8. Some time has passed by the, from this time of victory and this time of describing the uh, ministry of Samuel in this circuit. It came to pass when Samuel was old that he made his sons judges over Israel. The name of his firstborn was Joel and the name of his second was Abijah and they were judges in Beersheba. But, verse 3, his sons did not walk in his ways. They turned aside after dishonest gain and took bribes and perverted justice. Now, it reminded me, because this is a sad statement for any dad to have said over his son. Samuel is on this circuit of ministry and serving God faithfully, but his sons did not serve the Lord. Does it remind you of anyone in our study in Samuel? It's the same pattern that we saw with Eli and his sons. Eli even himself had drifted away. We don't have any indication that Samuel did, but in the home, somehow, some way, that distinction of commitment in Samuel's heart didn't pass over, wasn't caught by his sons. Not only that, but they decided in their place of spiritual leadership to take advantage of people with dishonest gain and bribes and, and even perverted justice. You couldn't even trust them to, to determine what was right or wrong. They made decisions that would benefit themselves. 
and Samuel's sons. It's a sad statement. But it reminds me of what John says because John says later on in his letters, he says, I have no greater joy than to hear my kids or my children are walking in the truth. And here's an exact opposite of that. There's no greater sorrow to a parent's heart when their kids aren't walking in the truth. And Samuel's older now. His children are adults. And his new, a new generation, this is representative of a new generation coming on the scene. His sons and all the young people that they represented, their generation. And because of verse 3, verse 4 takes place. It says, Then all the elders of Israel gathered together and came to Samuel at Ramah and said to him, Look, you're old, and your sons do not walk in your ways. Now make us a king to judge us like all the nations. You know, there's always a danger with new generations. It's a great freshness with new generations. That's not a danger at all. I think there's new generations of, you know, like in the church, there's, of course, new generations by age. Uh, there's new generations by new believers. Uh, th- th- there's a freshness and an excitement and a, and a wonderful zeal that comes through new generations, but there's also a danger. And there just seems to be in every new generation, in every stage where the new generation starts to despise the older generation as if their value and contribution to society or to the church is no longer valid. And let's just do away with the older generation and the old ways of doing things. And, and don't you know there are new ways to do things now? And, and in some ways, that's, that's very, very true. I, if we were still typing the bulletin, every single one of them on a typewriter, I would want someone in the new generation to say, hey, dude, you know there's an internet now? A What? So we're just typing away our bulletin and then putting it on the mimeograph. Do you guys remember the mimeograph? Were you the thing, the big thing that you turn and as soon as the teacher gave you the piece of paper that came out, it had purple ink on it, what was the first thing you did? Yeah, a lot of you don't know. You, I'm talking to the older generation, I know. And the new generation says, what? Remember we used to write letters on a piece of paper, put them in an envelope, address the envelope, put a stamp. I mean, you, you see now you just email, you probably send, you know, dozens and dozens of an emails in a week and maybe a few years ago you'd send two or three letters. It's just things have changed for sure. And new generations bring freshness. They bring new perspective. They, they bring, I, I embrace the new generation in the church and I embrace the newer generation of things that are happening that we might harness for the kingdom of God. But there is a danger New generations offer both a great freshness, but also provide a great challenge as they begin to assess the older generation and cannot distinguish between offering good advice and trying to undermine, well, even undermine those old Ebenezer stones, you know. They're walking through and go, what are these rocks? And we've taught them about the Ebenezer stones and the value and not to forget where you came from. And in another place in the Bible, it speaks of not removing the ancient landmarks. And of course, that was a a reference to the boundary lines of property. But there's a great spiritual perspective. Don't remove the ancient boundaries. Truth is truth in every generation. It's delivered a different way, perhaps. It is refreshed and illustrated a different way. But truth is truth. Jesus himself said, I am the truth, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No one comes to the Father except through me. You can't move that as much as you would try. You'll only cause confusion. And here's a newer generation coming on the scene responding to bad leadership. And they responded the wrong way. They're seeing things the way they are, and they want a significant change to take place. They want change. They saw not only how old Samuel was, but also that his sons were not godly men, and they were spiritual thieves. And it's sad. It's sad that both Eli and Samuel had sons who failed to follow the Lord. Eli, as we studied him, appeared to be too easy on his sons, where Samuel seemed to be away too much from his sons. I mean, that's what I get back here in chapter 7 as he had this circuit type of ministry which would put him away from the home quite a bit. He was fulfilling the call of God in his life, but now being away created perhaps a vacuum that his sons didn't listen. And watching bad leadership fed the flesh. You guys that are in spiritual leadership, 
For example, at this water baptism, I encourage the pastors uh, to take out with them as I do from year to year, but this is, I made a very strong emphasis this year, is of all the people that they're serving with, to pick one person uh, that they're discipling, they're pouring into, that they're serving alongside of. I want them to pick one person, and I want, to tra- I want them to be trained how to do water baptisms. And so they did, and you saw them in, in the video, and you guys were there, you saw the different people. But before we went out uh, for the water baptism, I gathered them together. I gathered all the men and the security folks and everybody that's there to help, uh, the ushers and folks that were in the water, and I said, look, um, and this is for all of you that weren't in the water, so this is for the sake of everyone, uh, but they got it first. I said, I want you guys to, to be very careful and, and um, understand this is an important day in people's lives and this is very spiritual, but I want you to understand that when you stand in the water, your faces are gonna be facing all of those thousands of people that are up on the, on the sand there, up on the beach. It's hard for me to call that a beach, but I guess it is, it's the beach. It's the sand or whatever, they crushed rock, whatever it is. Fake sand, fake beach, how's that? And I said, I want you, I want you to know something that when they see you face to face, there is a higher expectation now on you that wasn't there before. It's the same as standing on the stage of someone leading in worship or coming up for a testimony. When, when you are face to face with someone in the church, you are now held to a higher standard. There, there is a higher expectation upon you now that when the baptism's over, the videos will be playing. You will be walking around the sanctuary and if you don't take this serious, then just get out of the water right now. Let's just be, just get out, it's fine. Let's get out right now. Uh, I won't hold you to it. You're, vol- you're voluntarily coming in. No, those aren't all my exact words, but this is what I share with them, and then we prayed. Because that's a very significant thing that they were a part of. They were a part of a very special part of someone's life, and they represented the Lord, and they represented the church, and they represented the church family to the church family by being face-to-face, and that's no small thing. You know, sometimes we go through, you know, we had hundreds and hundreds of baptisms, And because we had hundreds and hundreds of baptisms, it's very easy to just say, oh, that's just just a baptism. It's just a bunch of people getting baptized. And we just go through. And, and, you know, it's not two or three where there's just a focused time where there's just two or three people and and, uh, we can spend a lot of time with them and just, you know, right there. No, there's there's hundreds of people coming through. Just, you know, there was a lot of people, but we still haven't seen what Peter saw on the day of Pentecost. I want to see that one day when he preached the gospel and 3,000 people got saved. And do you know how long it would take for to baptize 3,000 people? I want to find out. I'd like to find out. I think it'd be awesome just to get a sense of what they experienced in one day, in one moment, 3,000 people. But I repeat it now for the sake of those of you that were in the water, but I also repeat it for the sake of you, those of you that in many different ways, not just for the church, you have face time with people, therefore you are responsible for that face time. Your life matters. Your testimony matters. Your witness matters. What you do with your life matters. How you use your freedom matters because your life matters and people are watching your life. Well, you go, well, I don't want people to watch my life. Too bad. It's just the way it is. People are looking for hope. They're looking for direction. They find out you're a Christian. Isn't it amazing sometimes we're faced with unbelievers that know more about being a Christian than even you do and you get rebuked. You ever been rebuked by an unbeliever? I have. It's very embarrassing. It's very humbling. I just shake my head and go, Lord, I, I, don't, I just need help. Like, how can you, what, what's this all about? And, and God just reminds me, I love you, and I'll use anybody, including a donkey, to rebuke you, son. I want you to know that you matter. I, I want you to know that your life matters. I was driving. I'm not a speeder, by the way. I just want you to know. I'm not a speeder. Uh, I'm accused of driving like a grandma, and that's just, I don't care. I'm not in a hurry. I like leaving early. I don't have a fast car. I just have an old, you know, 170-something thousand-mile Toyota. It gets me from A to B. I don't care. I don't need one that goes rum, rum, rum. Mine that goes wee, wee, wee is fine. It's no big deal. I don't have any problem. I don't speed. I'm never in a hurry. Um, generally, generally. I mean, obviously, I'm sure there are times when I am. But this time I was driving my wife's car, and it's got, you know, it's a little bit different than mine. It's a, this electronic stuff. So it, it, you know, it tends to go faster than mine. 
just automatically. I don't, and so we were on our way. We were not in a hurry. We were avoiding traffic on 225, and we were headed over for breakfast, not in a hurry. We had just been here on Monday, um, welcoming the kids to the first year of the school year, and it was so exciting. And so we were heading off just for a morning of breakfast so Marie wouldn't have to cook breakfast or anything. And, and I'm heading down, and I'm going in a new part of town, and I got off 225 over there, and I got over here, and I'm over. I don't even know where I was. Um, and I saw a flash. And I'm like, who's taking my picture? No, I didn't think that. It was the city of Denver parked a van in the median. First of all, that's not fair. (laughs) And second of all, I hope it was taking a picture of the car in front of me because by the time I looked down, I think I was over the speed limit. I don't know how much, but I I was over the speed limit. But I was just thinking, you don't even need a person to rebuke you. There's a Denver city van parked in the median. (laughs) that says, you're going too fast. And I'm like, that's not fair. There's not even a person in there. Is there a person in there taking pictures? Like, what, what is this? But they're, you know, you, you, you look at life. And if you're sensitive enough to life, you'll find that. And so I'm talking about it all day. I said, I hope I don't get a ticket. I hope I don't get a ticket. I hope I don't get a ticket. I'm going to fight the ticket. That's not fair. Why did they put a van in the middle of the media? And that's not fair. And Marie's going, you're going to, you were, you're going to ticket. I'm like, I don't need to know. I'm like, <laughs> <laughs> but if I get a ticket, I probably deserve it. Probably. (laughs) I don't know. (laughs) Rebuked by a van. That's a new one. (laughs) Or those red light tickets. Or I remember uh, not too long ago, my friend Tony was here with his wife. Uh, They've since moved back to California. But I remember her showing me a picture of the red light camera. And Kiki, if you're watching, very, very sorry. But you're not here. So um, she showed me the picture and she was like, (laughs) <laughs> something like that's how I remember it it was like oh, she says, what's this that's not me that's not me and you got this new generation back in first Samuel now that is is seeing the the discouragement of the leadership they're they're not following the ways of the Lord and they come to the false conclusion to Samuel so give me a king we need a king we need a king you know maybe Maybe it discouraged them to see the leadership the way it was. Maybe they were disillusioned. You know, I look those words up. We use them so much. I like to work, you look words up in the dictionary, just in the regular old Webster's dictionary. To, we use words so much. I wonder what the meaning is. To the word discouragement, the definition is a loss of confidence or enthusiasm. A loss of confidence or enthusiasm. That fits this. You see bad leadership, you lose confidence in them. Disillusionment literally means disappointment resulting from the discovery that something is not as good as one believed it to be. You're disillusioned. It's not what you thought it would be. Sin often will do that. Where you thought it was going to be one thing and it disillusions you. It's not what I thought it was going to be. It didn't end up where I wanted it to be. And it's important we understand how vulnerable we are, church, when we're discouraged and disillusioned. These are two words that can be seen and come up in our lives following God, serving with others, in his church. Unrealistic expectations can sink us and send us on a path other than seeking the Lord. Turn over to Hebrews chapter 12 with me and let me show you. Hebrews chapter 12. Disillusionment and discouragement are times where we we really, really need to wait on the Lord. Hebrews chapter 12. It's a very familiar passage, but too often we end too soon when we're reading it. And so pick up with me in verse 1. Let's get the familiar out of the way. It says, Therefore we also, since we're surrounded by so great a cloud of witnesses, this is Hebrews 12, verse 1, let us lay aside every weight in the sin which so easily ensnares us and let us run with endurance the race that's set before us, looking unto Jesus, the author and the finisher of our faith, who, for the joy that was set before him, endured the cross, despising the shame, and has sat down at the right hand of the throne of God. For consider him, who endured such hostility from sinners against himself, lest you become weary and discouraged. Notice, in your souls. That's a deep discouragement. It's a deep depression. It's a deep darkness. Consider him. 
so you don't become weary and discouraged. You've not resisted, verse 4, to bloodshed, striving against sin. And have you forgotten the exhortation which speaks to you as sons? My son, do not despise the chastening of the Lord, nor be discouraged when you're rebuked by him. For whom the Lord loves, he chastens and scourges every son whom he receives. You know, in context of remembering all those that have gone before us and in the context of considering Jesus, the Bible says be careful. If you consider him and you focus and you, you, you look to him, it will enable you not to become weary and discouraged in your souls. I believe we are seeing a picture in 1 Samuel chapter 8 of a discouraged nation with a new generation. And one of the reasons I say that is because there's no mention of prayer. Now, these are the elders. Don't for, don't, let's not miss the, the actualities. The elders here, these are the elders. These are the leaders that have come to Samuel. No doubt influenced by the people. And the elders come with no prayer. They just, they know it's not 20 years earlier they were repenting. 20 years earlier they were humbling. 20 years earlier, they experienced victory and have now had 20 to 25 years of relative peace. And now with the first sense of these bad leaders, they say, we don't want, we don't want it the way it's always been anymore. We, really, what they're saying here, it's, it's a significant statement. What they're saying here is we don't want judges anymore. Or let me take it even a step further. What they're saying is we don't want God's way anymore. We found a better way. We found it. We know a better way than, than, we won't get into this mess again, your sons. As if there wasn't another man on the planet earth that could judge them. Or they don't look back to the judges of the difficulty in the book of Judges over and over and over again. There was that cycle of sin and how God delivered them and God used it even in the weakness of leadership. And, and they're, just, they're saying, I don't like it the way it's been. We want, it, we want something new. We, we want something, you know. And so what do they do? They do what's normal. They start looking around and they see, you know, every, it seems like every other single, every other nation, every single nation that we see has a king. We don't have a king. Okay. Every other nation, from what I see, looks like they're very successful. We're not doing well right now. What's the difference? We don't have a king. Ah, oh, I get it. Logically, we need a king. No, we don't just need a king. We want a king. No, we don't just want a king. We demand a king, Samuel. You're old. Your two sons are, are no good. And, of course, somehow they, they declared that there's no other possibility of anybody else being a judge on the, all of the population of Israel. Isn't that the way it works? You just like, you come to the worst conclusions in the most difficult of times. I also see a, a broader picture here too that it seems as if the national leaders, the spiritual leaders, were more concerned with national security. They were more concerned with national protection. They were more concerned about political leadership and their overall safety instead of the spiritual health of the nation. And Samuel, a spiritual man, could see that the demand was evidence of spiritual decay. And in verse 6 it says, this thing displeased Samuel when they said, this is back in 1 Samuel now, this thing displeased Samuel when they said, give us a king to judge us. You think you'd be displeased? Dis displeased? I know he's taking it personal because we'll see it in a moment, but I don't think it's just personal. He cares about the nation. He cares, like, do you guys really understand what you want? What you, you want a king? You don't, you don't want me? You don't want my sons? You, I'm still alive. I know I'm old, but I'm still here. And he does the right thing, of course. He says, Samuel prayed to the Lord. And the Lord said to Samuel, check this out. Heed the voice of the people in all that they say. Heed the voice of the people in all that they say to you, for they have not rejected you, but they've rejected me that I should not reign over them. According to all the works which they have done since the day I brought them out of Egypt, even to this day with which they've forsaken me and served other gods, so are they doing to you also. Now therefore, hear, heed their voice. However, you shall solemnly forewarn them and show them the behavior of the king who will reign over them. You know how when you pray and you just want God to answer all your prayers? Do you really? What if you're wrong? Do you want him to answer all your prayers the way you want them? Or would you like God to overrule you sometimes? Just tuck that in the back of your mind when you're praying tonight. And, and go ahead and include it in your, in, in your prayer times. Say, God, here's all, but overrule me. Because 
If I'm wrong, I don't want you to give me what I want because I really want what you want. I don't want, don't give me what I want. I, I, I think back in other episodes in the life and the history of the children of Israel where, well, this wasn't the first time that Israel rejected God. They rejected him at Sinai in Exodus chapter 32. They rejected him in Numbers chapter 14. The whole wilderness wandering. In Psalm 106, would you jot this down? Or No, you know what? Turn there so you can see it in your own Bible. This is one of the most sobering passages in all the Bible, Psalm 106. See, the Jewish leaders here had no faith. They took things into their own hands. And God says they're rejecting him. If you would have asked them, I don't think they would have said they're rejecting God because they didn't have God's perspective. God's perspective was, hey, Samuel, it's not about you, man. Jesus would say the same thing, that a prophet's without honor except in his own country. They're rejecting him. That's why when you're sharing the gospel with people that you love and your family, you're sharing the truth and you're rejected, I mean, it hurts, it takes it personally, but you, you can almost hear heaven say, hey, you know, they're not rejecting you. They're rejecting me. And then you say, oh, but it still hurts. And God says, I know, I know. Look at this in Psalm 106, verse 14. It speaks of the children of Israel in the wilderness wandering and says, but they lusted exceedingly in the wilderness and tested God in the desert. This is Psalm 106, verse 14. And he gave them their request. And you're like, amen, God, thank you for giving me my request. But he sent leanness into their soul. God's answer to Samuel is, look, I know all about this rejection. It's a pattern. And you know, Samuel, they're not rejecting you even though you are taking it personally, even though it does hurt. What you're witnessing, Samuel, with my people is what I've seen all the way back. This is my relationship with them. This is the human condition. He says, give them what they want, but warn them. And isn't that, I, I was looking at that as just for, for me personally, it's, it's like the role of the pastor. You know, you give them, give, give, give the church the word of God and give the church the, the, the service and, and serve them well, Ed, but warn them. Warn them of the decisions and warn them. Put the choices before them. I think of Elijah. He went through the same thing. Choose you this day whom you will serve. How, how long will, well, that was Joshua, but Elijah says, how long will you falter between two opinions? It seems to be a pattern. Jesus says, you know, you're either for me or against me. Warn them. Warn them. There'll be times when I'm in the process of, not just me, but the pastoral team and you guys is, you know, just opening the word where I'm laying before uh, a couple or a family. This is the way it is and this is what the Bible says and, and this is the answer. And, and then you'll see that they're just not tracking and they're just not accepting and they're just not receiving. And there are times where the Holy Spirit says, they're just about ready to leave your office, Ed. You better warn them. Warn them of how they came in and how they're leaving. It's like God would say, you have that sense of where you've covered the topic and you've opened the word, but warn them because they're walking out worse than then they walked in. They're walking out worse of you, out of your office, Ed, than when they first walked in. You need to warn them. It's, you need to warn them. You need to warn them. And that's what Samuel was called to do. You, you need to warn them. Forewarn them. Forewarn them what they're going to get when they get a king. Verse 10. So Samuel told all the words of the Lord to the people who asked him for a king. And he said, this will be the behavior of the king who will reign over you. He'll take your sons and appoint them for his own chariots to be his own horsemen. Some will run before his chariots. He will appoint captains over his thousands and captains over his fifties. He'll set some to plow his ground and reap his harvest, some to make his weapons of war and equip him for his chariots. He'll take your daughters to be perfumers, cooks, and bakers. He'll take the best of your fields and vineyards and your olive groves and give them to, your, to his servants, verse 15. He'll take a tenth of your grain. Another word for that is he'll tax you. He'll take a tenth of your grain and your vintage. He'll give it to his officers and his servants. He'll take your male servants and female servants, your finest young men, your donkeys, put them to his work. He'll take a tenth of your sheep and you will be his servants. 
And you will cry out in that day because of your king whom you have chosen for yourselves and the Lord will not hear you in that day. God wanted, to know, God wanted Israel to know the problems that come with a king. When they thought they were solving problems, in reality they were replacing problems with problems, bigger problems. All of this section is to imply that they didn't live with this kind of tax. They didn't live with this kind of bondage. They didn't have, they, they, they had a relationship through the judges with God directly. They didn't have to go through all this. And this was even in addition to, you know, this taxes and stuff was in addition to their ties. This had nothing to do with spiritually. This was purely a governmental, they were asking for a government like all the other nations, but they missed it which so often we can do when we're discouraged and we lean on our own understanding. Many today do the same thing when faced with problems. They take things into their own hands and make things worse. I'm reminded, and how can we not be reminded of taking things in our own hands and making them worse? How can we not think of Sarai and Abram given the promise of God and then waiting and waiting and waiting? And they became impatient. And they began to look at the reality of life. They began to look at the facts. You have to understand, Abram and Sarai made their decision based on the facts. They didn't, this this wasn't, they were old. Beyond childbearing. Yeah, I know God gave me a promise, but have you seen my body lately? I can barely walk. And all of the other things that go along with knowing your body and your age and understanding the biological clock. They were knowledgeable about that. And and the reality and the logic and the facts of the situation overruled the spiritual promise of God. And they took things into their own hands, came up with the dumbest idea that could possibly be brought into a marriage. I've got a handmaid, Abram. What do you think? Why don't you go have sex with her and she can bear the promise of God? This would have been a great opportunity for Abram to say, I am a man of God, I will not do that. But instead, sure. Here's something that you may need to understand. That was culturally acceptable. That was a culturally acceptable option and alternative when there were no children. It was just what the world did. So today we would translate that into, hey, you know what? I've got a spiritual problem. I'm waiting forever. I know how to fix this. It's what everybody else does when they have this problem. I think I'll fix that and I'll fulfill God's promise for him. And of course, this, that, that, that child that was conceived, his name, Ishmael, in conflict with the promise of God that came later, Isaac, they are in conflict. They were in conflict from that moment on, caused conflict in the home, caused conflict between countries. Conflict, the conflict is still going on as I'm speaking this second between Ishmael and Isaac. Why? Because of impatience. Why? Because of, I mean, it was so much so that somewhere around Genesis 17 ish, uh, Abram says, You know what, God? Take my Ishmael. Take my Ishmael. We don't, need, we don't need your promise. Take my Ishmael. We've got it taken care of. And God said, no. He is not the child of promise. And now they live with the consequences of that bad decision. Israel is repeating the same thing here. It's the same thing, different circumstances. The promise of God always supersedes the act of man. And, and even with logic, even with knowledge. That's why, if you haven't already, you really need to make Proverbs chapter 3, 5, and 6 one of the verses you memorize this year. I hope you memorize the Bible. There's such, been such a de-emphasis on that over the years. We put ver- verses, we give you verses at the beginning of every month for you to memorize. We give you that reading plan, and then Jason's developed into a prayer plan, and then on the flip side of it, there's the different verses on the back that we want you to memorize we want you if you put three verses in your heart a once a month you're gonna have 36 verses in your heart by the end of the year like you don't you remember when peter remember we talked about the three thousand people that were baptized remember the bible study that peter dropped on them that day when they saw the day of pentecost everybody speaking in tongues and they thought everybody was drunk you remember the, the dynamic powerful anointed message that peter shared do you know how he shared that off the top of his head 
He didn't say, wait a minute, wait a minute, I need to get my scrolls. Oh no, I don't got my scrolls. Where are my scrolls? Well, you know, people couldn't own scrolls. They were very expensive. So even if he did have one, it was probably only a portion or one book of the Old Testament. It's not like he'd go, I gotta go find my Joel scroll. Where's my Joel scroll? No, he shared Joel because it was in his heart. The prophecy of God pouring out his spirit from the prophet Joel was being fulfilled right there in Acts chapter 2. And, and so for you, you know, with, with the access that we have to the scriptures so much, you may just, you may not, you just stop the discipline of, of, of memorizing. Because technology has changed. It's the old generation. We don't need to memorize anymore. I got the iPad. What do I need to memorize for? I got an iPad. That's on my phone. I've got, a, I've got an iPhone or some other thing that they call a phone. I don't know. If it's not an iPhone, I don't know really what it is. So just messing with you. Just make sure you guys are still with me because I get a sense that this is a convicting thing I'm sharing with you right now. You should see your faces. As some of you assess, you know, honey, there has, I haven't memorized a verse in years. And so I just want to encourage you, you know, go down to the Walmart or wherever you shop and get some three by five cards and just do it old school. Write it out on the three by five card and put it in your pocket and memorize it throughout the day. And then file that card in a little something or other, whatever you file them in and keep them or put them on a paper clip and watch the stack continue to fill. But you'll see as the stack fills, your heart will enlarge because you're filling, you're, you're filling your life with the scriptures so that if one day you don't have a Bible or one day your battery is no longer working on your phone or your tablet, you have the word of God in your heart. The Holy Spirit will bring to your remembrance what you've been taught. If the well is dry within you, then the Holy Spirit has nothing from which to draw from. That's why we have you take notes or we encourage you to take notes within a Bible study, whether it's this time or you're listening on the radio, to take notes. Why? Because that helps you to remember what was said. And then, I, I didn't look up all the statistics, but you know, there's, there, there are statistics of how you remember what's spoken, what's seen, and what's reviewed. By the time you're done with review, it's like really a high number percentage of what you can remember. And then you can do what I do, and I like to go back through my old notebooks from years ago and just see what the Lord was teaching me when I was a chump new believer. Didn't know what I was doing. Thinking I knew everything and I really knew nothing. And the Lord was so gracious with me and so patient. And I start comparing my notebooks. And as I start comparing my notebooks, I'm like, whoa, I'm a, still a chump. <laughs> but in a different way. God's working on another part of my life. He's refining this. And, and I find that he speaks to me the same way. And he has for 20 plus years. And oftentimes he's speaking to me about the same thing, whether he's saying, "Good, well done, good and faithful servant, or... Ed, you've got some growth areas. I want you to depend upon me. Because when the temptation comes and you're faced with the facts, what's before you? The destruction of your marriage, that's just the facts. The bill that just came in, that's just the facts. The light that flashes on the van that they parked in the median, that's just the facts. The, the reality of what's happening at work, the difficulty in the family, the, when you're faced with the facts, you don't want to respond to the facts because you may make, give me a king. We don't have any good leaders here. We need a king. Do you really? Was that from the Lord? You need a king? The reason why you don't have a king, Israel, is because you're different from every other nation on the planet. That's why you don't have a king because you're special. You're the apple of my eye. I'm going to deal with you differently. I'm going, to, I'm going to directly appoint people so that I can relate to you directly, Israel. And you need a king? Abram and Sarai, I promised you a kid. You don't think I know how old you are? You don't think I know I'm going to make you wait for it? You don't think, you know, you know, you know I'm about, in, in just a few years, and God didn't drop this on them because they couldn't handle it, but God could have said, in just a few years, I'm going to find a little, a young teenage girl that's betrothed to be married. And she's not going to have any relations with her husband. And she's going to show up pregnant. I'm going to do that just a couple thousand years. Just jot it down, Abram, you'll see. You don't think I can create a child in your wife's womb? 
You think you can do it better than me? And you, 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 you look at your life and you can see when you're faced with the facts, you often revert to human responses because it is the facts. You don't understand. You see it this way. Instead of waiting on the Lord, why? Because we'll renew our strength and God will fulfill his promises. Would you turn over to Galatians chapter 6? Galatians chapter 6. So we don't want a bunch of Israel, um, Ishmaels running around. We want Israel. Governed by God is what that means. And in Galatians chapter 6, it's important to heed the warnings of God. Samuel's warning them. It would be good for them to heed the warning. God warns us about things in our lives, about sin in particular, because he wants us to avoid the pain of sin, and he wants us to avoid the pain of consequences, and he wants us to enjoy this life as a testimony of his faithfulness. So he warns us. He warns us. And he says, notice what the Bible says in Galatians 6 verse 7. Do not be deceived. God is not mocked. For whatever a man sows, that will he also reap. For he who sows to his flesh will of the flesh reap corruption. But he who sows to the spirit will of the spirit reap everlasting life. That's a warning. And an encouragement at the same time. We're faced with decisions every day. What will I do with my freedom in Jesus? How will I use it? How will I respond to this warning for God? Paul narrows it down to two choices. Will I respond in the spirit or will I respond in the flesh? Some of these situations we're facing, they cause emotional response. They cause physiological responses. Your heart starts beating more. Sometimes if you're in a discouraged place, the blood flow slows down. Your heart rate slows down. Your body starts to shut down in discouraging times. Your mind starts to think strange things. There's physical responses to things in life. And if we're not careful, we'll feed that with the flesh. Because you're feeling it, you're feeling it, you're feeling it. And I don't just mean some of the simple decisions. Should I go get drunk or should I go live with my girlfriend? Or, I'm not, you know, those, are, those are actually some of the easier decisions that to respond in the spirit. But it's a sobering passage. Every thought, every action, every word brings with a blessing or a cursing. And when it comes to our relationship with God the Father, you can't just decide to cross a side, cross, a, go, you know, cut across the Bible and expect to come out ahead. You know, you can't say, well, I'm a Christian, I love God, but me and my boyfriend are living together. It's no big deal. Or I can get drunk sometimes and, and hey, man, you know, the, it's logical and it's legal. I can just go smoke pot and everything. You know, I don't care if I stumble someone else. It's my freedom. It's my life. I can just yell and scream and break things and control. I, I could do whatever I want. No, be careful. If I'm speaking to you right now, be careful. Because what you sow is exactly what you'll reap. And so don't be deceived that you think you can sow to the flesh and get spiritual benefits from it. You're not, it's not going to happen. But also be encouraged that if you sow to the Spirit, you will get spiritual benefits. You won't get the fleshly benefits. When you sow to the Spirit, you're, you're not going to get flesh. You're not going to feed your flesh. Like, so you're angry, but you, you get into the Word and you pray. It's not, God's not going to make you more angry. Make you lose control. You're not going to hear from God. You know, Lord, I'm just feeling like this. I'm feeling like this. And your God's not from heaven. Well, well, you have permission. Just go take him out. No, he's going to comfort you and calm you and minister to you and reveal a scripture to you or, or just in that time renew your strength. But listen, what you sow, that's exactly what you'll reap. And if you live for eternity, you see the bigger picture, you'll sow to the Spirit. Everything you do in a touch will last for eternity. So, hey, Heed the warnings of God. Did you see what, just, just go back real quick here in verse 10. Samuel tells all the words. This is back in 1 Samuel 8. He says all the words. Look at, the, look at what he says. If you listen carefully, this is not good. This is not good. This is going to be the behavior he will take. He will, verse 11 now, I'm just going to walk through and show you some of the verbs here. He will take, he will appoint, they will run. Verse 12, he will appoint, uh, some he'll make, they'll, they'll make weapons war. In verse 13, he will take. Uh, in verse 14, he will take. Uh, in verse 15, oh, guess what he'll do? Take. Um, you know, he'll give to his officers. Verse 16, oh, guess what he'll do? Take. Doesn't, I mean, if the king, if we just replaced king with the word king and we inserted the word sin, sin will take. 
and it will take. You know, if sin is your king, you have a horrible master because all sin done is take and take and take and take and give to his own cronies. Sin is destructive. You know, but the Bible, not every king takes. Did you know that? Just to leave you a little bit of hope here. Not every king takes. We have the king of kings. He came and he gave. So if you're going to choose kings, choose the right king. And we want a king above. Okay, better be King Jesus because anyone else is going to take your, you're, you're just going to, you're done. It's all your kids and all your posterity, everything. You're done. It's, it's just what you get with kings. Now, as we wind down, we're almost done. Verse 19. Check this out. There's that word. I don't know how many times you've noticed it. In verse 19, do you see that word? Never in the, old, in the New King James, nevertheless. 111 times I looked it up. 111 times it's used in the Bible, in the New King James. It's a simple transition word. I didn't look up, though. I didn't have time to look up how many times it's used in the positive. Because nevertheless, you know, bad, 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 bad. And then when you hear the word nevertheless, you go, oh, something good's going to happen. But that's not what happened here. You know, there's a warning. And then this is, if, if there are positive and negative uses, because I know there are, this is a negative use. Nevertheless, the people refused to obey the word of the voice of Samuel. And they said, no, but we will have a king over us that we may also be like all the nations that our king will judge us and go out before us and fight our battles. Whew. Samuel heard all the words of the people or he repeated them in the hearing of the Lord. And the Lord said to Samuel, heed their voice, make them a king. And Samuel said to the men of Israel, every man go to a city. The people were set in their ways. They refused to obey and I just jotted a little note down in my, in my notes for me and for you. Are you set in your ways? Because this is what it looks like. Are you set in your ways? You know, sometimes people use that like a badge of honor. I'm just set in my ways. Be careful. You want to be like a new wineskin or the Lord can do something new and fresh in you. Maybe that's another reason why the next generation was so frustrated because there wasn't any flexibility. You know, people will live in bondage to drugs and alcohol and all their other kinds of horrible stuff and bondage. And when you come to them and say, hey, just turn your life over to Jesus. He can set you free. They'll say, oh, no, 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 I don't want that, man. I'm fine where I'm at. I don't want that. And then they'll go out and tell you how miserable things are. I wish I were dead. I wish I didn't live. And, and then you tell them to turn their life over to Jesus and say, no, I can't handle that. And this is what's happening. This is the warning. Here's the solution. Here's the answer. And don't fault them too much, though, please. Because maybe you're making the same choice. You might be running from God's reigning over your life. From his rule in your life. You may, have, you may have another dastardly king in place of King Jesus. And your response is, oh no, it's, everything's fine. Oh no, I'll handle it. Oh no. When in reality, you're just in bondage to the king of sin. And Samuel keeps taking these things to the Lord. Three times he goes to the Lord with these concerns. And I believe God's brought you here tonight for a decision. God's brought you here today for a decision. Like the children of Israel, you're going to have to decide. You're going to have to decide if God is going to reign over you or you're going to be reigned by someone because you're going to serve someone. There's no neutrality. You go, well, I serve myself. Well, yourself is not under King Jesus. So yeah, you are making a decision. And I believe God's made, brought you here. Believer, this is not just a salvation message. I believe there are areas in your life that God has brought you here to hear that God's bringing you to this place and he's saying, you've got to make a decision now. You've got to make a decision. You've got to make a decision. And the decision you make is either going to be to the flesh or to the spirit. But you've got to make a decision. A non-decision is a fleshly decision. Well, I'll put it off and I'll think about it. But God has been clear. He's clear for you. There's probably something I didn't even mention in the Bible study that you brought here tonight. You're listening on the radio. God, what am I listening to this guy for? Because God's got your number. He knows you inside out. And I haven't even mentioned, you know, we don't go through a list. I don't have a list of, you know, the top 100 sins in society today. I hit on some of the popular ones uh, because they are popular. But you know what you're into. You know what you're in bondage to. You know what you're hiding. You know what you think you're getting away with. 
And God has brought you here to make a decision. It's very possible that you're suffering from the very ravages and miseries of having another king in your life. You're not really free in Jesus. You're bound by the power of sin and it's destroying you. Do you realize that? Do you understand? God wants to lift you to a higher level of life. He wants you and me to take, he wants to take out of the bondage of corruption and bring you into the glorious freedom of being a child of God, living under the reign of God. If you ever wondered what it looks like, chapter eight, you know, the question is, who is your king? Who's your king? Because chapter eight, I mean, it's gonna do this, it's gonna do this, it's gonna do this, it's gonna do this, it's gonna wreck your life. We want a king anyway. And so, Lord, we just pray you would protect us. We, we are human in every sense of the word. And you are ready to deliver us. You are so ready to rule over us. And we don't even like that word. We think, nobody's going to rule over me. And we're mistaken. Because Jesus, in another place in your Bible, you said to us that if we present ourselves to sin, we are a slave of sin. And if we present ourselves to righteousness, we are a slave to righteousness. Whoever we present ourselves, that's who we're a slave to. And so God, if we've asked for another king, maybe we've been hurt by leadership, spiritual leadership. Pastors made a mistake or moms made a mistake or you know, just people that are influential in our lives have, have hurt us. And we've let that hurt change, you know, move us to, to choose the wrong king. I just pray for those that are hurting right now um, by mistakes that have been made against them that you'd bring comfort, especially like Eli's sons. Like if it's been spiritual leadership, it's been in our church, Lord, forgive us. Forgive us. You know, I don't know the hearts of the men and women that serve with me, but, but I see them and I watch them, Lord, and I know that they love you and they love this church and, and I don't know of every decision they've ever made or how they handle things, but they do that before you, Lord, and I know they love you. I know that you've raised them up. So if we've hurt anyone, God, please forgive us. Please open a way for us to make things right and, and reveal the humanity, Lord. But also as a congregation, if we've heaped on unrealistic expectations, God, forgive us. Can we just be human and serve you in the power of your spirit? And we don't want to be like Eli's sons and we don't want to be like Samuel's sons and daughters serving you. We want to be men and women that, that love you supremely and are able to enjoy the benefits of heeding your warnings, Lord. So we look forward to you being our king and we submit to your kingship tonight in Jesus' name. Amen.